I oversee the uh, data analytics and AI teams at the UN. So we get to do a lot of uh, analytics, NLP, uh, some machine learning, computer vision, bots, all of that good stuff. Um, but uh, knowledge graphs is something new for us. So this is not going to be a very technical talk. I think there's many people in the room here who know much more about ontologies and semantic networks and, uh, and graph algorithms than, than I do. Um, what I, what I want to share with you is what sparked our interest in knowledge graphs. What uh, problem are we trying to solve with it? And what are we trying to get out of it? So I think I have to click this button. So this is what we, we uh, typically do. Uh, clients come to us, departments within the UN come to us, and they come with a, a question, a problem. So we take a lot of inputs, and we, we do our thing. We do analytics, we do NLP, lots and lots of NLP, uh, other things, and uh, outcome uh, certain insights. I call them insights. I can, I can actually give you an example of what one of these insights looks like. Oh, I see it's, it's really hard to read the slides, but uh, this is an example of a, a project that we did to look at the cost of conflict, of war, right? What does that cost in terms of lost trade, lost GDP, uh, children not going to school, lost agricultural production, all of these things. So we take inputs from, for example, the, in this case, the World Bank, socioeconomic indicators, and we take a conflict database that has detailed records of the past 60 years of conflict, uh, really month by month of what the intensity of the conflict was in countries around the world, and we do our thing. We, uh, we start analyzing statistical analysis and we, we come up to uh, associations, and in this case, such strong associations that we could actually create a calculator that says, well, if, if uh, country X starts a conflict tomorrow, it's going to cost them 40 million per day, a conflict level two uh, it's going to cost them 14 million per day. So that is, is very useful, for example, for our peace building colleagues, uh, because they, they can go to countries and, and, and say, wait a minute, uh, you know, we know you want to go to war, but you know how much it's going to cost you, and, and try to convince them to resolve things peacefully. Um, but actually, I think you know, beyond that, that immediate use of the data, those are fantastic insights. You know, to put a price tag on every hour of conflict. That's something that the world, that's knowledge that the world didn't have before we did this study. And, and, and we need to do something with that. And then I go back to my problem. So we, we do that all the time and we get all these loose insights. And all we do with them is to put them into a spreadsheet, into a PowerPoint presentation, into a PDF or, or a tool, a little calculator for a particular client, but they remain isolated. We don't capture that knowledge. We don't value it as, as knowledge and store it and, and do more stuff with it. So that is, is really what we want to do. And then another thing is, our data scientists, before they finish these, these projects, they spent hours, as, as every data scientist probably knows, you spend 80% of your time really understanding the data. And that is either pouring over the data or playing with Python or R or Excel to, to manipulate the data, and also talking to subject matter experts. And we're, we're not talking formal ontologies here, but it is domain knowledge that they're gathering. And uh, where does that go? You know, that's, that sits in these, in these insights, and we're not storing that. So if only there was some kind of storage structure where we could put all these insights in, all these heterogeneous insights, because they're, they're all different, right? In, in both in data type and also ontologically, uh, they're all totally different. And, and, and what kind of storage structure could we use to put all these things in? Well, you guys know the answer, of course. Um, what we want to do is capture these insights as graphs. And what you don't see on the, the way it's projected here is uh, the arrows uh, of all the insights going into the cloud there, into that, that uh, graph that we're creating. And then, of course, what we want to do is to de-isolate all these different insights by connecting them. And again, you don't see the connections on the screen, but uh, 
uh, I'll, I'll come with a concrete example of how this works, how we're connecting different insights. And then what do we want to do with them once we've connected them? Well, of course, we, we want to reuse that knowledge. We want to create new insights. And uh, in order to do that, we need uh, graph applications. So that's one thing that we're working on to, uh, to build that, to get familiar with that. Um, but there's actually something quite, quite extraordinary happening here. Because all these, these things, the, the blue thing there and the yellow thing, and in the middle there's a green thing that you don't see, uh, they came from different domains. Those are people that don't typically talk to each other. The people that mediate conflict and, and for example, the people that look at uh, trade, uh, they don't talk to each other. And by connecting these, these insights in our graph, we can create new insights that merge these, these domains and that we could otherwise never have come up with. So to make this a little bit more concrete, this sounds all a bit, a bit abstract. Uh, let's make it very concrete. Um, so let's go back to our, our case of the, uh, the cost of conflict. And let's take a country, I uh, uh, made up a uh, fictitious country called Krovistan. And Krovistan has GDP, of course, and it has uh, trade. And, and then we can uh, take this concept of conflict Krovistan being in conflict with, with another country. And uh, we can start putting all these, uh, it's, it's hard to see here, but it says uh, affects, uh, the conflict affects the trade by 0 0.12. And, and that's a number that is coming out of our insights, out of our little calculator or spreadsheet, right? So we're taking these insights here and we're putting them into a graph. Now what do we, uh, let's, let's do a few more of these, right? So we take some trade data. And uh, again, you can't see the arrows, but there's, uh, I think, 2 billion going from Krovistan to Lama Land, and there's 1.8 billion in, in imports coming back, and there's a lot of trade uh, from Almandia to, to Krovistan, because Almandia is a, it's a big country. Um, uh, so we, we put in the trade data. And now let's put in some political context. So the islands you see in the top, those are the Buru Buru Islands, and they belong to Krovistan. Uh, at least Krovistan likes to think so, but um, much to their dismay, uh, Lama Land has occupied the Buru Buru Islands since 2014. And they get away with it because they're being supported by Almandia, which is a super powerful country. Um, so, you know, we, we've got all that in our archives in the UN, in uh, all this political context, uh, and then, we come across a newspaper article that says, uh, demonstration in the capital of Krovistan, uh, people are demonstrating against Lama Land. And uh, you know, our analysts pick up these, uh, that's, that's what we do every day. So I, I, you know, I made up a lot of the names and, and, and uh, this example, but this is really the kind of stuff we deal with every day in the UN when we come in in the morning. And, and taking these newspaper articles, uh, doing sentiment analysis, et cetera, that's, that's really what my, uh, my team does. So, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's put all of this in a graph as well. Uh, so we've got the, the Burubulo Islands, we've got the historical context, and then we've got this demonstration. And again, the, the country's there. So now let's take these, these three graphs that we created and combine them. So we've got at the bottom, we've got the countries which uh, we used to, to connect the graphs, those are the, the connectors between these graphs, right? Uh, and we've got the, the gray stuff at the bottom, you don't see it, uh, that's the, the trade stuff. And we've got the conflict stuff and we've got the, uh, the demonstration there. And, and now what we can do is to start creating new insights. So a demonstration uh, that semantically has something to do with people being angry, right? Uh, you know, we use word embeddings, so if you see it as a vector in a vector space, that is, uh, you know, the vector of demonstration is, is close to uh, that of, of angry people and, and of conflict, right? So we, we can draw an arrow there, and you know, that's sort of very crude to just draw an arrow, it's more complicated than that, but uh, you, you get the principle. And of course, we already knew that uh, the conflict in, in uh, uh, Krovistan has an impact on the Krovistan trade. So now we can say, well, this might 
uh, increase the economic risk. This might affect the economic outlook for Kyrgyzstan in uh, uh, 2020. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to get out of it. Now, what, what I'm showing here, this is not something we have already, right? We're, we're working towards this, and, and this is what we want to achieve. Um, so that's, that's uh, what we want to do with, with Knowledge Draft. There's many other things that we want to do, but I thought, you know, it's things similar to what other speakers have mentioned uh, earlier this morning and yesterday. I thought this example would add something new, that uh, a new way to, to look at the use of Knowledge Graphs. So just to give you a little bit of uh, more information on, on the environment in which we work. So you've already guessed that we have a huge ontological diversity. We deal with all aspects of, of human life from you know, uh, education to uh, economic growth to environmental pollution to uh, humanitarian or to, to refugees, uh, anything. Um, we are also a multilingual organization. We have six official working languages. Um, which actually is an, an opportunity in a sense because we have uh, hundreds of thousands of documents that have been meticulously translated in all these six languages by human translators and that is gold for our machine learning experts, right? They, they love that stuff. Uh, but it also creates problems because uh, we have different headquarters in the UN and they prefer different languages. If you go to Santiago de Chile, our headquarters for South America, most of the work is in, in Spanish. The official documents get translated in six languages, but all the sort of the working documents, uh, the travel reports, project reports, whatever, it's mostly in Spanish. Some of that filters back to New York here, to headquarters, but very little because not everybody speaks Spanish or doesn't want to bother to speak Spanish and, and uh, so, we have these linguistic silos, right? And that, that's, that's a problem. And that's actually also, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but that's another opportunity for graphs because you go down to the semantic level, the linguistic problem disappears, right? So that's something else we're, uh, we're working on, but uh, that's for another day. Um, we are not very good at data governance. Traditionally, uh, we don't have an existing practice of documenting knowledge. So those are problems that we have to uh, overcome um, so our approach has been uh, to not to try and, and boil the ocean, as uh, uh, another speaker said uh, before, uh, to have an incremental approach, start small, experiment, learn, uh, get some of our clients excited, um, leverage what is already there in, in terms of taxonomies and, and vocabularies within the UN. Uh, and a lot of data, of course, that we have uh, within the UN system and also externally. We get a lot of help uh, from, from others uh, in our work, uh, fortunately. Um, so in the, in the first phase that we're working on now, what we want to do is to take three or four of these uh, cases that we've done before and translate them into knowledge graphs, uh, just like the example of the cost of conflict that I mentioned. So we want to take three or four of them. And then in the phase two later this year, um, we want to uh, take three new cases and we're thinking of using uh, security, uh, the metrics around sustainable development goals and environment as, as topics that we want to look at and uh, start trying to create some of these new insights like I uh, uh, showed you. Um, there's a uh, couple of points that might come up later in the year that we've uh, that I've not spoken about and that we, we don't want to start with. We want to first get our feet wet and, and, and make sure we're comfortable. Um, but of course, when I drew this, this simplistic arrow saying, well, demonstrations lead to, to conflict and conflict need to uh, economic, uh, uh, reduced uh, economic output, uh, that's very simplistic. In reality, all of these things are probabilities. Um, so one of the things that we definitely want to look at eventually is uh, probabilistic graphical models um, to, uh, you know, to uh, quantify all the different probabilities of relationships. And the second thing that we realized we were going to have to deal with is uh, time. So all of, almost all of the things that we deal with, be it uh, GDP or diplomatic relations between countries, um, they all change over time. And uh, we could just update our graph and have the most recent situation. But actually, the history is interesting to us because we're interested in why it changes. Why did the economy go down? 
why did the diplomatic relations deteriorate? And uh, so that is, we want to keep all that historical data. And we're sort of looking at, and I, I don't have a good answer to this, but there's many experts in the room here, so hopefully over lunch somebody will give me the answer. Um, uh, how, how we represent this, uh, do we make you know, lots of connections for, for one for every year, or do we put that GDP, many of these GDP bubbles as a sort of a, a chronological chain, uh, or do we create a time tree uh, which it might actually be interesting because we're often interested in taking a snapshot of, you know, this and this happened in February 2017 and what did the world look like back then? So these, you know, having a complete view of that graph in February 2017, that would be fantastic for us. It's almost like having a time machine. So those are things that we look at. Um, a few takeaways. So we're uh, using knowledge graphs to solve a problem of taking many small disconnected insights and, and being able to leverage those for predictive analytics. Um, we are dealing with a uh, multilingual environment and a wide ontological diversity. Uh, our approach is to start small, experiment, grow. And in the future, we want to look at probabilistic and temporal models. And those are problems that we don't really know yet what to do. So that brings me to my, my last slide. Uh, any help is welcome. We often collaborate with academia, uh, with private sector, with individuals. Um, so uh, we're very happy for uh, any, any support that anyone can give us, especially with the, uh, the more thorny problems. And I think we have some time for questions, right? Yes. Mm. Hello, though. All right, thank you very much, Lambert. So we have time for a few questions. Um, did, did you evaluate the, 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 the idea of having um, a semantic wiki to... Uh, so so let, let's, let's start with the data. Do you have a lot of textual data uh, as, an, as an input? Yes, yes. Of okay. Yeah. And did you evaluate the, the usage of a semantic wiki or, well, a kind of infrastructure so the, the data comes with uh, a kind of tagging by the users? Mm -hmm. Well, we're starting to introduce uh, XML structures in our data, but what, what you're talking about, semantic uh, tagging, that uh, we're not there yet, no. So we, we keep our documents as, as text, and we use NLP to analyze them, and, and you're right. Uh, at some point, we could just take the entire repository and translate it into something with uh, semantic tags, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. Hi, are you considering modeling um, cause and effect and decision making in this process? Uh, yes, obviously, ideally, we would want to get from, from correlations to, to causal relationships, but, uh, you know, in the context in which we work, uh, there are so many things in life that affect it. Uh, you know, as they always say, a butterfly flapping its wings in, in Brazil might have an effect on this. Uh, but I think when we uh, look at probabilities, uh, then we, we start using probabilistic models, it becomes much easier to reduce the number of factors that have an influence and look at sort of the most contributing factors and get closer to that uh, causal model. Uh, we'd like to get there, we don't have it yet. Mm. So this is going to be our last question. Hi, um, wondered if you get involved at all in cyber warfare and all we hear lately about uh, manipulation and social networks, uh, international uh, manipulation of elections and things like that. I know there's great research going on at MIT Media Labs on this topic. I was just curious if this is something the UN has in scope. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs>